right, it doesn't look like the slides translated to the PC from the Mac. <laughs> I'll go, let's go with it. I like it. I'm glad to be here with you. It's been, uh, it's been a few years since I've been back. Um, 30 years ago, I was sitting in your chair in the Entrepreneur Lecture Series and uh, listening to uh, uh, my idols talk about um, how they failed and how they succeeded and, that, and excited to be back here. I've, I've spoken a couple of times. I'm glad to have my, my son here also. Um, Paul Jr. is here. And, and uh, let's... Um, Let's talk about uh, the season, the, the ride that I've been on since I was sitting in your chair. And then we'll get into some of the details that I think might be helpful and interesting to you as entrepreneurs. Um, how many are actually view themselves as a pre-entrepreneur or entrepreneur, or that's kind of what you want to do? Who's here because you have to be here and you don't really think, I, I, you're, you don't really want to be an entrepreneur? Nobody? Once? All right. I love the honesty. Two, three, four, five. Okay. <laughs> That's cool. Maybe I can convert you by the end of the, the, end of the presentation. My roots, I started up, um, came from a, an, a typical large Mormon family, eight, eight kids. Grew up in Southern California. My family heritage um, is strange, um, half from Sweden, and then my mom was born and raised in uh, the Mormon colonies in Mexico. Anybody from the colonies? Yeah? Your family? Yeah, um, great place to grow up. Uh, my grandfather had an adobe house and cement floors and a tin roof. And, uh, and uh, it's fun to go back there and help create the venture capital industry. I'm always, I've always been a dreamer and a doer. Every year since I was a kid, I would start up a business and launch it. And a lot of these businesses were, in the early days, uh, were for, I don't really know why I did. I think my mom dropped me on my head. But then after, after a while, it was to, to fund my dates. And so I would come up with these crazy ideas in math class, because I wasn't very good at math. And I thought, what if I could you know, take a girl out in a helicopter and take my Corvette, which is, this was my Corvette I had when I was uh, 17. And I, would, and I would go to the helicopter in the Corvette, and then the helicopter would fly around, and there would be a crowd waiting for us, and a Rolls Royce would pick us up. And uh, I just needed somebody to drop into this little idea. And so I, I came up with this crazy idea, and I asked out the local beauty queen. And I started this event, and I, and I, I started crazy dating in Southern California. And after a while, all my friends started just doing these outlandish dates. So the, this is a Bell Jet Ranger helicopter. At the time, it was $750 an hour. Um, this is a white uh, 59 Rolls Royce Silver Cloud. And I rented it when I was 17. And it turns out the company I rented it from was a front for the mob. And who else is going to rent a 17-year-old a Rolls Royce for cash? <laughs> Ask me the story sometime. So anyway, and then and this girl I went out with her once, and um, and that was it. No kiss, nothing. Just just wanted just wanted the experience. One of the problems I have, and you're going to see this, is that when I dream about something. I just let my mind go, I lock it in, and then I'm in trouble. As Soon as I get to that end state and I walk around in the future and I think, this is pretty cool. How cool would it be to be stepping off a Bell Jet Ranger helicopter, the local beauty queen, as a crowd screaming at you? That would be fun. And, uh, and then, I'll, and then I, I go into autopilot to go do it. And I have to be very, very, very careful about what I daydream about. Because something kicks in in my subconscious and I go into auto drive and I, go, I drive myself crazy if I don't complete it, as you will see in a second. I served the LDS mission in Ecuador. Any, any uh, Ecuadorian return missionaries? Nobody? Guayaquil, Quito? On my mission, I learned about this thing called the hierarchy of needs, meaning that people really don't care about the gospel if they don't have enough to eat, if they can't feed their families, if there's a security issue in town where they're running from the local drug gang. And, and as I learned about this, I, and as many of you did when you went on your mission, I wanted to go back and do something. And so I've been able, to, I've been blessed with the ability to go back and do something, to create tens of thousands of jobs in Latin America for the children of Lehi, helping them focus on their basic physical needs, food, shelter, clothing, safety, and then eventually they can get to self-actualization. So I focus up here um, in terms of the, the dreams of venture capital, but there need, people have to have a job to be able to get there. This became my driving mission in life. 
I educated at BYU, and the second phase of my life, when I got to BYU, I realized that it was not the experience I thought I was going to have. I don't know if you guys were disappointed. I was really disappointed when I got here. This was in the 80s. I was expecting that there would be some cool student nightclubs. What I got was the Cougar Eat. I was expecting there was going to be some cool dance clubs or something like that, and there was a place called the Star Palace back in the day. Um, I, I loved to communicate, and I thought there would be a nice a student newspaper we could all just write for, and there was the lockdown um, BYU universe, which I wrote for, but it was highly controlled. And so I spent my college experience trying to fix my college experience. So going back to the kid, I, I didn't actually, I hadn't counted this up until I was doing this presentation. I started early, in my early days, 11 startups, including my lemonade stand when I was eight years old. I had a little skateboard making business, window washing business, lawn mowing. I had a sprinkler, um, ma and manu um, sprinkler business, when la landscaping, I guess. Uh, pool service company. And this, by this point, I was 17. And, and this, is what I, this is what I used to pay for my, my dates, basically, um, and my cars. When I was at BYU, I decided that um, with some friends that BYU needed an off-campus student newspaper, so we created the Student Review. And this is the founding team of the Student Review, and it went on for about 10 years. It was a lot of fun. Um, the next thing I created was an off-campus dance club called the Ivy Tower, and I rented this place for $100 an hour, and uh, in fact, I, had, I was out of money. Um, I was kind of down to my last $50. And I, I used the $50 to make flyers, and then I bought a, a six-foot sandwich with the other half of the money, and I said, free food. And, and then I went to the band, and uh, I said, hey, I'll pay you at the end of the evening. And I went to the DJ, and I said, I'll pay you at the end of the evening. And I went to the owner of the building, I'll pay you at the end of the evening. And I had racked up, I was going to have to leave town if this didn't work. So it's like Cortez, you burn the boats, that is motivation. This had to work. By the way, I've never done this before, right? It's my first, my first big party. This had to work. I had to go home from school anyway. Either this had to work and pay for my school, or I had to leave school because I was out of dough. And, um, and we killed it. Um, I, I netted $2,400 at the end of the evening, and it was so popular, it, it, we turned it into a dance club. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And I was killing it in college with a dance club. And uh, it was kind of a cool way to meet girls. And, and, uh, and it contributed to my extended stay at BYU. <laughs> my wife asked me, so how many years were you at college? By the way, this is one of my businesses. After the dance club, I started a place called the Backstage Cafe. And uh, I let myself daydream with a friend named Mark Tullis. During the summer, we were just saying, what would be the ultimate student hangout? And so I still remember Mark's words. Well, the waitress would walk up to you and she'd be reading a book. And she would say, can I get you something like a backgammon game or cards? And by the way, do you want some food? And so this mental image drove my need to go create that space. And if you could see, it's brick walls with instruments and people hanging out listening to jazz music. It was a blast. We had two hour, three hour waits to get in. Um, and I have no idea why I did this, because it had nothing to do with my career plan. I just let myself daydream. Um, and, and so when I met my wife, I was working at a, I created a nonprofit 501c3 recycling company to hire the homeless here in Provo to recycle. Again, I can't really explain it other than I saw homeless people recycling my, stealing my trash in front of my house in Southern California. And I said, these guys will work. They're out stealing all the recyclables on the street. Who says homeless people can't work? And so I'm, I, I just identified what they're already doing, and I made it a job for them, and I paid them for that. And we had 40 homeless guys working for me in Provo. I had every homeless guy in Provo working for me. <laughs> and so my wife goes, OK, let me get this straight. You're almost 30. You don't really have a job. You haven't finished your undergraduate, and you hang out with the homeless. Not exactly my dream boat. And I said, well, I suppose that guy has a job. <laughs> and uh, she never actually said that, according to her. So, um, and, uh, and so I spent 
a lot of my college experience trying to fix my college experience. And I went home for one summer, and I started a water purification company. And I, I saw a need, I filled it, I created a service company called Pure Water. It was a division of a company called Pure Water International. I noticed they didn't have a service arm, and I set up a service organization for this company. And, the, and there was this moment that changed my life during that summertime. The CEO of the Pure Water International came to me, and he said, you seem like a smart kid. You're working way too hard, and this business is never going to take you where you want to go, ever. The most you're ever going to make is a couple hundred thousand a year. Well, I was making, you know, I was making six figures in the summertime, and I thought it was pretty good money. And I, and I was a PR major, I knowing when I get out of college, I'm going to be making $27,000. And so I'm thinking, I'm probably okay making six figures. And he said, listen, you can spend 24 hours a day digging ditches, or you can build rocket ships. Wouldn't it be more fun to go to the moon? And I said, what do you mean? He said, you need to think a little bigger. You are never going to get where you want to go. You seem like a very bright, capable young man. Up until that point in my life, nobody had ever asked me that question about thinking big. Not one single person. I am spinning around, creating a bunch of service businesses, having a lot of fun, meeting girls, and uh, dating, and whatever. But I wasn't really, I was spinning my wheels. My life was not progressing. And, and so, I handed that business over to my dad and my younger brother. I quit that day. I literally walked away from it and just, it was just a lightning bolt moment. And I went back to school. And I, have, and I, and I created a little, a little diagram for myself. And I said, all right, self, where is this idea going to take you? It's not the beginning of the idea, it's the end of the idea. Is it a dead end or is it going to take you to the stars? And it's better to shoot for the stars and hit the moon than aim from the gutter and hit it. And so I went back to school. I had, a, I had two classes I had left to graduate. I uh, didn't want to do it, but I did. And I started thinking about focus. And I got married. Um, so, and, I, and I was a young father, newly married, elders quorum president, with a mortgage, and I'm working, and I took my first job working for a company, a startup company called Folio Corporation, the first text retrieval engine. And I was, I was in the high priest, I was in the stake, not, uh, not high priest, the stake priesthood meeting, and um, this is David B. Haight, and he came with John Huntsman, the billionaire, to our stake priesthood meeting, and, and, uh, and they, were, they were the speakers. And David B. Haight uh, called me up, I was asked to call up um, come up to the front and report on the home teaching statistics for our ward and to an apostle. And, uh, and so I got to um, talk about this and he asked me about the families. And then after I reported on my home teaching to an apostle of the Lord, he pulls me aside just a, on a one-on-one -on -one as I, he's about to sit down and he whispers to me. He said, Paul, do you want to know how you can become really, really rich? Not the question I thought I was going to get at that moment. <laughs> Would you guys like to know the answer? It's going to cost you. No, I'm just kidding. He said, promise you'll give everything to the Lord and truly mean it. You can fool yourself, but you can't fool the Lord. And what does it mean to truly mean it? We've all covenanted, right, to, to, give, to give God what we have, our time and and our resources. This was the second pivotal moment in my life. And this introduced the rocket years. Um, I had a series of um, software companies that I started. The first one was a crash and burn. Um, great experience. Um, on my time, I don't have time to go into it, but I'll be glad to answer questions. Um, the second one, I decided I need to go to school. So I ended up working for uh, Folio Corporation, the first text retrieval engine. I'll, get, I'll show you the case study in a second. Four and a half years, it was like a college degree. And then I spun some technology out from Folio, and I created Nolix in 1997. And Pablo, what year were you born? So you're two years old. I do not remember the first two years of your life. I do not remember it. 
It was a total blur um, during the startup days. <laughs> Love you too. <laughs> you wouldn't have known had not said anything. <laughs> and, uh, and then I sold, I sold the company and I took a day off and I decided to go solve some more problems. I, some people call me an investor, I'm really an entrepreneur. Since those days, I've created nine investment funds. I've raised over a billion dollars for over 100, and I've launched over 125 startup companies. Some of the companies under vSpring Capital you might recognize. Uh, Ancestry, in here in Utah, Control4, uh, Landesk, I invested in Altiris with Ralph Yarrow. Um, and I created a couple of funds, one in Mexico, Alta Growth Capital and Alta Ventures. In 2008, I was invited to go to Mexico to help create the venture capital industry in the country of Mexico. It's not every day you get invited to go create an industry in a country, and I had to say yes. So our family moved in 2000, August 2009 to help create the venture capital industry in the country. Everybody thought I was nuts. One of my Jewish friends pulled me aside. He said, my wife thinks you're running from the law. Is something wrong, Paul? I was not running from the law, and we were out to help create an industry and create jobs in Latin America. We launched Alta Ventures, um, the most successful venture fund in Latin America. We have offices now in Silicon Valley here in Utah, Monterey, Mexico, Mexico City, Lima, Peru, and Buenos Aires, and we're opening an office in Santiago, Chile. We've been able to create some great co companies in Latin America, and we've been able to take some great companies from here and take them down to Latin America. So why nail and scale it? So I'm in the middle of launching Alta Ventures. And I look back on my career, and I've invested in 100-ish companies by this point. And I noticed a pattern of failure and a pattern of success from, the, from entrepreneurs. And this, the guys that had figured it out had a habit of getting it right over and over again. And there were certain principles that they were following. I created a presentation. I went out and started sharing this presentation with people. Do you see the world like I do? Do you see a pattern here? This was years before Lean Startup. It was probably seven years, six years before Lean Startup. And, and I created this presentation. I'd given it enough times where I felt like I was onto something. There was a shift in the model that needed to happen in order to increase the odds because most startups fail. And, and I, when I brought the idea to, to Nathan Furr, he was getting his doctorate degree at Stanford. He was very excited because he had seen the same three and through his doctoral research he identified the same patterns and problems that I had identified with my I call my street MBA and so together we put our street learning and his book learning his PhD to work and we created what I think is a great work and I actually go back and I listen to the book sometimes because I forget now <clears throat> unless you think it has all been a rosy I've had many failures and, and, and these patterns of failure were, were which what drove me to write Nelith and Scale. This was in Mexico. I'm looking at this saying, all right, Levanta, uh, they raised almost $100 million and hit the wall. The product didn't work. Uh, Cogito, $30 million. They never got a product to market. And I started seeing patterns where these companies that had raised significant amount, amounts of capital never even got their product to ship or work. In fact, one of the things that we identified was the more money that we gave a company before they nailed their breakthrough value proposition, the customer value exchange, the product, customer product market fit, the higher the probability of failure. And we saw this over and over again. So it was crazy. The investors were contributing to the failure of these companies because we, we took a great team with a great idea, we gave them too much cash, and then they started to become internally focused focused on politics and internal issues as opposed to having to solve the customer market problem. Because if you have 30 million bucks in your bank account, you don't have to listen to anybody. And you can go gunsling till you're, till you're out of cash. And now we've had a, we sold a few companies and we've taken a few companies public. But the reality is most startups fail. And they fail for lots of different reasons. So I'm gonna take you through kind of a fun ride. Um, how long do I have? All right, I can do it, I can do it. All right, so lots of reasons why startups fail. If this were an interactive session, I'd be asking you, I'm just gonna say there are lots of them. I'm gonna show you a few reasons to absolutely guarantee and engineer failure. Number one, 
launch without a specific customer in mind. I, I share this, this, this concept with my brother Jason. He goes, it reminds me of the Homer Simpson episode, season two, where Homer's brother, Homer finds a long lost brother that has a car company. And he invites Homer to come and create the car company that's gonna save his company. Okay, Homer, pick out anyone you want. Are you sure you want to give me a car? Hey, you know what these things cost me? There's maybe 40 bucks worth of steel in them. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I'd like a big one then. We don't have a big one. Why not? Because America... Big cars. Well, then give me one with lots of pep. Sorry, our cars don't have pep. Why not? Uh, because Americans want good mileage, not pep. Homer... Tell the nice man what country you come from. America. Do you hear that, you morons? This is why we're getting killed in the marketplace. Instead of listening to what people want, you're telling them what they want. Homer, I need your help. You do? Yeah. I want you to help me design a car. A car for all the Homer Simpsons out there. And I want to pay you $200,000 a year. And I want to let you... I want a horn here, here, and here. You can never find a horn when you're mad. And they should all play La Cucaracha. Can do, Mr. S. And sometimes the kids are in the back seat. They're hollering. They're making you nuts. There's got to be something you can do about that. Maybe a built-in video game would keep them entertained? You're fired! What is my brother paying you for? What about a, a separate soundproof bubble dome for the kids? With optional strengths and muzzles? Bullseye! And another thing. When I gun the motor, I want people to think the world is coming to an end! Run, run, run! Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed stockholders, members of the press, your holiness, tonight... We are going to witness automotive history. All my life, I have searched for a car that feels a certain way. Powerful like a gorilla, yet soft and yielding like a Nerf ball. Now at last, I have found it. Ladies and gentlemen, presenting the car designed for the average man, the Homer. <gasps> Any questions? <laughs> so, so Homer drives his brother's car company into bankruptcy. The last scene of the movie is Takeda Mo Motors, is, or Toshiba Motors, something like this, is taking over his brother's car company. And, uh, and it, this would be funny if it weren't so true. Um, this was actually based on the Ford Edsel experience in the, in the 50s. Ford named this after um, his dead son, Edsel. And so, if the owner of a car company names a car after his dead son, is anybody going to give him negative feedback that this thing's ugly? He just doomed it right there. Then he built it in secret, and then he, then he launched it with a convertible two-door uh, station wagon, um, you name it, and, and it was the biggest flop in automotive history. Six years later, Ford launched the most successful launch in automotive history with the Ford Mustang, built by Lee Iacocca and his team. They designed it in an interactive way with husband and wife teams that would come in interactive with the designs in the show floor and they figured out the price, the position, the promotion and, and they came out with a, a, a massive launch and it hasn't been equaled since. I have had the same experience with my startup, Nolix. So I used to work for a company called Folio and, uh, and I was the product manager for Folio. Um, I worked with Kurt Allen and Brad Pello and, and uh, Mike Wolfram, the team there. It was a lot of fun. Very first text retrieval engine. It's Google before Google. Flop, we did floppy drives and then we eventually, this, I was a product manager for the first Windows product when the Windows version came out. And when we won the award, it was, um, there was two awards we won, PC Computing and, uh, and PC Mag. And PC Computing, it said, we, won, we were the mix master, slicer, dicer, ginsu knife of software products. I had built a product for everybody and nobody. And let me show you. When we sold these products, we sold them into 85 different industries, and I went and identified all the applications, dozens of applications, so very broad, right? You think this is great. No, it's not. We had, um, when I did the analysis, identified five people in the company were representing 80% of the revenue. The other 190 people in the company represented the, the other 20% of the revenue. So we were unprofitable, 
And while I thought we're building the sleek rocket ship, we were building something else. And the pieces started falling off, and the chickens and the, and the pigs are falling out the windows, and the doors are falling off. We couldn't maintain our velocity. And, the, and the, 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 the concept of the rocket ship is you leave the atmosphere, a little bit of energy takes you a long way, and you're, you're profitable, and you're just zinging along, as opposed to levitating. I'm burning cash. I haven't quite left the atmosphere. What we need is more fuel, more VC dollars. And, and if I don't know who my customer is, I can't, I can't achieve escape velocity and establish a beachhead that I own. And that's where you want to be, a safe place on a beachhead that you own. For example, every new product has a, new, has a customer that has a specific problem. When the pager came out, the customer for the pager was the doctor. And that technology, that widget, connected to the, the market need for that widget is what defines innovation. It's the intersection of invention and, and the market insight, how the market wants to consume that invention. So your job as an entrepreneur is to take your hypothesis into the world and try to talk to the customer to understand how the fit, the customer product market fit. So you're going to generate a new innovation, not just an invention. Lots of inv inventions that sit on the shelf. Lots of better mousetraps that never get anywhere. So there's a lot of research prior to um, Nathan and I writing our book. There was a lot of research about crossing the chasm, Jeffrey Moore, and, but there had been very little research on this early stage. We, we called it this black hole. Companies go in, they don't come out. We didn't know much about it back then. And so we did a ton of research on this early stage and wrote our book around that stage. Not the scaling stage, but the very early stage. And some of these concepts, we came up with some of them we borrowed. Most of them we borrowed. Um, but uh, we put them together in a process. And then we went out and tested the process ourselves. So Nolix, my startup, was an experiment around taking these concepts into the field. So this is my startup, Nolix. And I, and I had identified this text retrieval engine had lots of markets. The one that I chose to focus on was IT knowledge management. Help desk, problem resolution. You call up to help desk, hey, I have a problem. The answer sitting in the knowledge base. Seems like a simple idea today. Back then, it was revolutionary. Um, people were writing stuff on a piece of paper and spreadsheets. And so we created a knowledge base to allow people in the help desk environment to answer questions quickly. Very simple. And so we identified the intersection. What was the first point? Lots of people in the world, thousands and thousands of applications for text. What was the first one I was going to focus on? So the IT knowledge manager at corporations. So knowledge manager was the application. IT help desk manager was the customer. IT was the beachhead. And the problem they had is they couldn't answer questions in real time to the customers. Simple. Right? If we nail this, then we can go after knowledge management and, the, and, and sales and IT and HR and, and go into other markets. So we did it. We went back and we launched. And, and, uh, and I ended up launching the company and selling the company 20, within 24 months. We went from end to end and we sold it to a public, a public company in San Diego. And my choice at that point was to raise some more money and continue growing the company or go spend time with my son that I missed the first couple years, which I decided that might be more interesting at the time. And, and so we ended up um, launching and selling and, and came up with um, a theory that we validated. And so that was cool. I couldn't wait to go tell other entrepreneurs about what I had learned. And so I went and created uh, vSpring Capital and we raised money and started put investing into startups in Utah and eventually wrote a book about this to share the experiences. Another way to guarantee startup failure is to compete head to head with a, a, um, a, a, an entrenched market leader. I'll give you an example of Facebook and Path. So as you're thinking of launching a startup, we'll talk about market entry strategies and, and a lot of entrepreneurs have a very difficult time getting the market entry strategy right. So if I want to compete with Facebook, how am I going to do that? Switching costs are very high. And, and am I really going to be able to switch the Facebook customer? I, don't, I not only have to switch her, I have to get all of her friends to switch. Very difficult. I don't care what the feature checklist is. If you're, if you, and and, Pan, and, and uh, Path started this and, and they failed. Another way to enter the marketplace is a greenfield, to go create a new category. So Honeywell created the category many years ago, over 100 years ago, of the home thermostat. It's expensive to create a category, 
but if you can do it, it's awesome. Oracle created the category for the database. Larry Ellison is a billionaire today. Very few people can pull that off. It takes a lot of education because you have to tell the market what it doesn't know it needs. So Honeywell's been there for 100 years. How do you, how do you replace a market, entrenched market leader? There are several ways to disrupt, to, to get them out of their, their position. One way is to be 10 times better than they are. This is the case of Nest. They created a home thermostat that was 10 times better than the, than I started pulling the market away. Now, was Nest really after the home thermostat market? They were not. What were, they were interested in was the home automation market. And 24 months after launch, they were bought by Google for a billion dollars. Google didn't care about the thermostat, but what they cared about was the entry into the home automation space, which is a much bigger play. So think about this from the uh, Tesla. So Tesla is going after an entrenched market where there's cars, a billion dollar industry. Are they nuts? They might be. Uh, Clayton Christensen says pray for Tesla because it breaks his disruption model. But what I think Tesla is doing is they're not going after the car industry, they're actually going after beachhead to the energy industry, a trillion dollar industry. And, and Elon Musk is crazy enough to pull it off. So you have the greenfield. I'm going to talk about another way to enter the market. It's a disruption. So here's a greenfield idea. Lots of social networks. Eventually, Facebook emerges as the market leader. Now, how do we take on Facebook? How do you disrupt them? You disrupt from the low end. And so this is what freaks everybody out in the world right now, because college students sitting in the Entrepreneur Lecture Series at BYU have a very good chance at disrupting a billion dollar industry. Because you, you, know you don't know it's not possible. And let me give you a couple examples of disruptions that have, are threatening the social network industry. So the first was Instagram. One of the things about a disruption, it's sitting down below the curve. You have a well-satisfied demand curve. The market likes their social network. But when the parents got on, what happened to the kids? You got off. Why'd you get off? Ouch. <laughs> it's true. You, got, you don't want the parents peeking over your shoulder. It's the equivalent of, in my day of having this hiding in the, in the closet with the telephone and not wanting to, my parents to look over my shoulder. So when, and so new opportunities arose for social networks. And so a few guys at Instagram created a photo sharing network that was going crazy. And so Facebook came and bought it for a billion dollars. And at the time we thought that was insane. I can't believe you paid a billion dollars. Well, here comes Snapchat. If I thought Instagram was dumb, Snapchat is dumber. <laughs> Eight seconds disappearing text, I completely don't get it, right? Because I'm, I'm sitting on this demand curve looking down going, that's a stupid idea. Well, that's what, uh, that's what happens. The market doesn't see the disruptions coming because you're not, you're not talking to the existing customer, you're talking to a new unserved, unloved, underserved customer. And so that unloved customer down there, tried, Facebook tried to pay $3 billion. They turned it down. I thought they were nuts. Then there were 15. The last I heard, there were $30 billion. So what does it feel like? What does it feel like to, be, um, to, ha to have a disruptive idea? So I got this great idea. I'm going to let people rent my couch. It's, it feels stupid, right? How about this one? Let's help people take the bus. What I didn't know is millennials don't have cars. Why do you guys need help taking the bus? I don't know. This was another one of my favorite ones. Let's help teenage girls standing next to each other in junior high text each other because they don't have Wi-Fi during the day. What a crazy, stupid idea. My favorite one is, you know when you have all those great ideas and you're getting married? Let's share those ideas with all of our friends. Let's put a cork board in the cloud. So I, you know, sometimes if you're well served in a market, you're not really the customer for the disruption. It might be a, a, a younger market, an international market. Let me, let me show you what it feels like to, to be that guy with a disruptive idea. This is going to be a little loud. So if, if, if it's too loud, I'm going to ask you to turn it down here. Not, not mute it, just turn it down. Okay. <laughs>
All right. So that couch surfing business was obviously Airbnb, uh, over 500,000 um, listings. Um, this, this bus taking business, you haven't heard of it, but you yet will. It's called Wanderoo, and they're growing uh, significantly quarter over quarter, helping millennials take the bus. Um, that Wi Fi business, um, helping um, those teenage girls uh, text standing next to each other, it's called Jot. And, uh, and it just went crazy one day. It just, it just took off in and, and, and junior highs because 40% of US junior high and high school kids don't have access to the internet during the day. So they created a mesh network allowing people to talk to each other and text each other during class. That cork board business, obviously is Pinterest. I still don't get Pinterest, but they're killing it. Um, and the last idea is to scale it before you nail it. If you want to guarantee failure, scale it before you nail it. And it's actually the number one cause of startup failures. One of my favorite uh, poster children is Webvan. Back in the go-go days of the internet 2000, they raised $800 million before they figured out their business model. If I gave you $800 million, would you figure out your business model? I think every single person in this class would, but the problem is I gave you the money early and you didn't have to. Cosmo did the same thing, $280 million wasted, had no concept or clue what their business model was going to be. There's opposite examples of great companies uh, like Ryan at Qualtrics that's spoken here before, um, Jot and others. And so to end on a positive note, uh, how many minutes? Are we done? We're done? We're done? All right. Is um, target a specific customer, choose your market entry strategy wisely, and then nail it and, and then scale it. And, uh, and I have a, um, a process I want you guys to, uh, I, I, the beginning of the process is, is the idea. And before you take off, um, we created a product for you guys called the Big Idea Canvas. So once you have a great idea, don't do what I did and launch. Please don't do that. Ask yourself, do you want to spend the next five years of your life working on this stupid idea? Go out and, and, uh, and run the process that the Business Model Competition used this last year. And, and this was actually, this came out of last year's Business Model Competition. A group called Bed Sled inspired me to create the Big Idea Canvas and to help you figure out who the customer is, the pain, the market potential, the market entry strategy, and your potential exit. So you can go to bigideacanvas.com. You can download it. We're going to run an online, a global online competition. You can win 2,500 bucks. You can get access to attorneys and mentors. And it's a private competition. Your ideas are not shared publicly. But if you have an idea, um, it'll be launching next week. Go to bigideacanvas.com. And we're launching the beta. So I'd love to hear your feedback. Participate in this. Go through the Big Idea Canvas, and you can do the online version or the offline PDF and upload it. And I'd love to hear from you guys, and I'd love to see your ideas and fund your ideas. Thanks.